actually bringing the classroom here to where my home is and where I work and do a lot of evidence processing here at the Johnson County Sheriff's Office Crime Lab, our new state-of-the-art building here that we have. And so what I'm going to talk to you today about is the evidence process that we go through for DNA analysis and biological processing. So when we get a piece of evidence in, how we're going to look through it and see if we can find any body fluids and then eventually take those on for DNA processing. So in the DNA section, we want to be really cognizant of the fact that we all have DNA and we can put that DNA onto evidence if we're not careful. So we always want to wear gloves. So always the gloves and we change them very often so we're not getting our own DNA on the evidence which would be very bad for a case. So when we get a piece of evidence in, it normally comes in some kind of packaging. Biological evidence needs to be in a breathable type package like a paper, not plastic. And when it comes in, it'll have a seal here so that we know that it hasn't been tampered with. So the officer that collects this item or the crime scene person that collects it will put the evidence in the bag and then seal it with evidence tape. It's really easy to rip this tape, so I would know if someone had gotten into this piece of evidence and tampered with it somehow. And then we'll commonly see initials and dates on these as well from whoever collected the item. So it's really important when I get into this that I do not want to break this seal either so I can leave it intact so when this case goes to court, if it does, that the officer that collected it can say, yes, that is my seal and it hasn't been tampered with. So I'll open this piece of evidence in another location. So we have these disposable razors here, so we're never using the same object over again on a piece of evidence. And that also prevents contamination from one piece of evidence to another. And I'll just cut the package open so that I can get the evidence out. And so here we have a white shirt. I'm going to spread it out here. So the first thing that I'm going to talk to you about is when we get a piece of evidence such as this in, what are the steps that I would go through to try to identify any kind of body fluids that might be on this? So the two main body fluids that we get the most requests for here in the lab are for blood and for semen in sexual assault cases. So I'm going to go through those, show you a few of the techniques that we'll use to visualize those stains, and then show you some of the tests that we use to actually see if we are in fact dealing with blood or semen in those cases. So when we get a shirt in, sometimes you can visually see stains that are on it, especially if it's a light color like this is white. You can see stains. So we have this one here. You can kind of see here that this is a red-brown color. And so that might be a stain that could possibly be blood. And then there might be some other stains on here that are a little bit more yellow in color. Those could possibly be other body fluids, but we're not really sure at this point, but you can visually see those. So another lighting technique that we might use if you cannot actually visualize a stain with your naked eye is to use what's called oblique lighting. So that is simply just taking a normal flashlight and turn it on. And then you're lighting whatever item you're looking at actually from the side. And sometimes what this does is it'll make a stain pop out to your eye just slightly a different color, especially on an item where you might be dealing with a red blood stain on a red cloth or on a darker type item like a black or a brown. Just that little bit of difference in side lighting will make that stain pop out to you so you can visualize it. Almost like it's wet in appearance. At this point, any stains that you are able to see visually, either with your naked eye or using the oblique lighting, I'll go ahead and mark those right now as possible stains to test later on, either for our blood or semen test, depending. So, since this stain that we looked at earlier is red-brown in color, we're probably going to test that for blood later on. So how that I'll go ahead and mark it is, I'll identify the stain, and then I'll just take a Sharpie and start just very close to the stain and circle it. 
And then I'll give it an identifier. Each stain will have its own unique identifier. So for myself with blood stains, normally I will letter those, so A through Z. With semen stains, I'll usually number those um, in chronological order. So since this is my first stain, I'm going to call it stain A. And I will go ahead and just write an A right next to it so I have my stains identified for testing. The, the last resort that we can use for trying to identify stains is by using what's known as an alternate light source or ALS. So this is our alternate light source right here. And what it does is it has lights of different wavelengths on it. And for biological fluid stains, we're looking at wavelengths between 415 and 500 nanometers of light. This is not the visual light that you can just see with your naked eye. And so what it does is we shine that light onto whatever item of evidence we're looking for. And then by using a filter, either in the form of glasses, such as these, or a filter plate that you can put over a camera if you would like to take pictures of what you're looking at, it'll filter out all light except for what is fluorescing from the body fluid. So you'll actually be able to see stains that you could not visualize with your naked eye, especially again on darker colored clothes, which I'll show you the difference of what a stain looks like under the ALS from this white shirt to this black pair of shorts. The ALS has to be used in complete darkness. So we make sure that things like windows have the blinds covered so that the room can be completely dark. So what I'm gonna do is turn off the lights and then I'll have these filter goggles on for myself to be able to see any stains that we visualize. You could see how easy it was to see the stains on the nice light white shirt that we have. Unfortunately, it's a little bit more difficult when you have a darker type fabric like this black. So when we're searching something like this, we might try different wavelengths of light on the ALS to see if we're visualizing any stains or not. And then when we have a fabric that's dark like this, we are probably going to use something like a silver Sharpie that would actually show up on the black fabric instead of using a black marker, which won't show up. And that'll help us identify which stains we're going to test. Something to realize about the ALS is that when we are looking for stains with the alternate light source, anything that you see that fluoresces under that light, we're not really sure what the source of that stain is. Every body fluid except for blood will fluoresce under the light. So semen, saliva, sweat, urine, all of those will fluoresce. And then also things like soda pop and other fluids might fluoresce under the light too. So we're simply searching the item very quickly to try to identify any stains that we want to take on to further test for the different body fluid tests that we have in the lab. And then the last thing I wanted to show you is on something like this. So this is a piece of drywall that we actually, we can cut this out of a crime scene if we have to, to preserve blood stains. So on something like this, we are able to see the blood stains very easily. That's no problem, they're dark red stains. So we don't really have a problem visualizing them, but something we might do on a piece of evidence like this is actually determine what kind of patterns of blood stains that we have and are there any differences. So on this piece of drywall, we're actually seeing two different kinds of patterns. These two here look more like a contact or transfer pattern. Maybe somebody wiped their hand across. It just looks more like a, a smudge or a wipe. And then we have all of these little stains here that look like they came from blood actually flying through the air and hitting this drywall. So for instance, like this big stain down here or these smaller ones, they all look like they could have come from blood flying through the air and then hitting this wall. So how we would differentiate these is to call them two different patterns. 
Pattern A might be the wipe stains, and then pattern B would be these uh, circular stains that may have been somebody uh, being hit in the head, some kind of impact that may have created those type stains. And we'll test those separately for DNA, maybe thinking that those possibly could have come from two different people. We don't know, but we would differentiate them that way so that we could know what DNA came from which pattern. So the first test we're gonna do is the phenolphthalein test. We take one drop of sterile water onto a sterile swab. That's enough to pick up any blood that we wanna test. You don't need very much blood on the swab, just enough to be able to see a stain. Then we're gonna add one drop of the phenolphthalein one or two, and one drop of the hydrogen peroxide. And it should turn a nice bright pink color very fast within 10 seconds. And that means that we have a positive test. It gives us a good indication that we're dealing with blood. The next blood test that we can do is called the hematrace test. And this also detects hemoglobin but it specifically detects human hemoglobin. So it's supposed to be a human-specific test to tell us if we are dealing with human blood. However, this again is a presumptive test and there are higher primates such as monkeys and ferrets that react with this test as well. So it's not 100%, but it still gives us a really good indication that most times we should be dealing with human blood. So this test, actually fairly resembles a pregnancy test. It's very simple to use. What I would do is take the blood that I've swabbed up and add it to this buffer and we'd let it sit there for 10 minutes and then I'll add it to this card. And for our purposes today, I already have one that I've already extracted. So there's a blood sample in this uh, vial So I'll open this up, fill my pipette full of the now extracted blood, and just add it to the end of this cartridge. And much like a pregnancy test, if you get two lines, it's a positive reaction, and if you only get one, it's a negative reaction for human blood. And this test takes a few minutes to run. If you see a positive result immediately, then it's positive. But to call it negative, you would want to wait a full 10 minutes and make sure that there was no second line that formed on the card. This card has only run for about a minute, and we can already see that there are two lines there. The control line is on the top, which means that the test is working, and the test line is the bottom line, which is whether it's going to be positive or negative. And so we do not need to wait the whole 10 minutes for this um, since we're already seeing a positive reaction. If it was negative and we were not seeing that test line, we would wait a full 10 minutes to make sure that it didn't show up. Once we see this positive, we can take a picture of it and we'll definitely document in our notes that it was a positive test. Unfortunately, if you let these sit much past about half an hour, you might get a false positive starting to show up. So we don't actually keep these as evidence because of that reason, but we will take a picture or have it in our notes that it was positive. Sometimes when we're out at a crime scene, we might be looking for blood, but we don't get those nice dark red-brown stains that are really easy to see, either from somebody that has cleaned up a crime scene or you just get really diluted stains, and or you might be in an area like an office building where something like the carpet is really hiding those stains because that's what it was meant to do. So there are times when we're looking for blood that we're not really able to see with our naked eye very well, or that maybe we're searching for patterns such as footprints leading somewhere or just other patterns we're trying to pull out. So in that case, we're gonna use a chemical that is called luminol. And what this does is it works with the hemoglobin in blood as well. And if there's hemoglobin present, it excites the luminol to a state that it does not like to be in. And so to get back to luminol's grounded state, it emits a light blue fluorescence. And so if blood is present, we'll start to see a light blue fluorescence appear. 
Now this is again a presumptive test that we just use to look for patterns and other things can make the luminol for us such as bleach or other cleaning um, materials. So sometimes when cleanup is an issue it, it might pose a problem but during this demonstration I'll show you what bleach might look, at, look like when we use the luminol. So first I'm going to make the luminol reagent and the chemicals that are used are sodium hydroxide, hydrogen peroxide, and then luminol itself, and water. So we're going to do a ratio of seven parts water to one part each of these other chemicals. So here I have 350 um, microliters of, or milliliters of water, and we're going to put that into our spray container because we're going to spray this chemical onto whatever surface that we're testing. And then we're going to take 50 milliliters of our sodium hydroxide. And it doesn't need to be extremely precise, but as close as you can get it to 7 to 1 to 1 to 1. 50 milliliters of the hydrogen peroxide. And then finally, 50 milliliters of luminol. And this is in a brown bottle because it's very sensitive to light. So we try to keep it closed off to light. And for this reaction, you have to be in a completely darkened room. Or if this is something you're searching for outside, you're going to have to wait till nighttime when it's completely dark. And then possibly hope that there's no street lights or anything else that would hinder the process because it really does need to be pretty dark to be able to see this. So I'll kind of mix it up. This is the sheet that I prepared to use the luminol on. And let's pretend like this is actually a floor of a crime scene that you're trying to see any blood patterns that might be there. Maybe you think somebody cleaned up. And if you can see here, there's a kind of a diluted red stain right there. And I can kind of see, okay, maybe it's red, it might be blood, I don't know, but maybe there's some kind of pattern there that the luminol could help enhance or bring to light. So at this point, we would need to make the room completely dark. So we'll make sure we turn off all the lights. And then we're going to spray our luminol reagent over the entire area. And if we have a positive reaction with blood, it'll give a light blue fluorescence that'll start to glow, and then it'll start to fade. And then after uh, we see the patterns that have been placed on this uh, test demo, then I'm going to spray bleach solution on it and show you what it looks like if you were to actually be getting a reaction from something like bleach or a chemical cleanup type of a, a chemical. Okay, so we'll turn off the lights. Let me show you what it's like if you were to have a bleach or another chemical that's reacting. You're going to get kind of a sparkly looking reaction. So you see how that sparkles and then fades? That is more of the reaction that you would get with a bleach type substance. The next set of tests I'm going to do are the three tests that we have to identify semen. And being in the DNA section in the laboratory, we get a lot of sexual assaults. And this is the main body fluid that we're going to be looking for in a sexual assault. So the first test that I'm going to do is called the acid phosphatase test. It is a presumptive test. It's very quick. And it's actually testing for an enzyme that's found in seminal fluid. It's found in other body fluids as well, which is why it's presumptive, but it's found about 20 to 300 times more concentrated in seminal fluid than any other body fluid. So it's a pretty good indicator that we could possibly be dealing with semen. So this test, the first thing that I'll try is to take a sterile swab again, and I'm going to moisten it with just a drop of sterile water. And I'm going to attempt to swab the stain. Sometimes on clothing, the, the cloth does not want to let go of the, the fluid that's attached to the cloth. So I'm going to try it, and we'll see if it gives us a good reaction here. Sometimes you have to swab pretty forcefully to pick up the fluid. 
when you're dealing with cloth. And then this is our acid phosphatase chemical here. And what we're looking for, we'll drop it onto the swab, and what we're looking for is a pink to purple reaction on the swab. And that will give us an indication that we are dealing with semen. So here's a drop. You can do one to two. And this reaction takes up to 30 seconds to react. So it's not necessarily quick, but we're looking for a pink to purple reaction on this swab. And so I'll wait a full 30 seconds before calling it negative if it doesn't turn pink. But if it does turn pink, then we have a positive reaction. So you can kind of start to see this pink purple color forming here on the very tip of the swab. And so that's a pretty good reaction there. I would call that positive and just notate that in my notes that that was positive. Another thing you might do if you're suspecting that a stain is not being able to be swabbed up is you can actually take a cutting of the stain and apply the reagent straight to the cutting. So I'm going to take a disposable razor again. We do not like to reuse items here in the crime lab. And I'll just take a little cutting inside of my stain. Place it onto a separate piece of paper, a clean piece of paper. And then I'm going to apply the acid phosphatase reagent straight to that cloth. And it might take a couple of drops to get it soaked in there. I might use a little toothpick here to help me get the chemical soaked in there. And you can start to see this line here where we're getting a nice dark purple reaction. And again, it'll take up to 30 seconds. So, but you can see now how it's turning purple. And it'll just get darker and darker as it goes. But that give, this is giving us a much darker reaction than this swab because since we're directly testing the item, you're getting all of that enzyme you're testing for is all soaked into the cloth there. We have a second presumptive test that's called the P30 test. It's a test for prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, that is found, again, in seminal fluid. However, like many of our tests, PSA can be found in other body fluids, such as breast milk, so it is still a presumptive test. And the P30 test is very similar to the hematrace test, where it's just a cartridge that looks like pregnancy test. Almost exactly the same. And it works in the same way. It's an antigen antibody reaction. And what we would do is take another cutting and place it directly into a tube. And then we're going to add a PBS buffer to the tube. about 500 microliters or half a milliliter. It's about right. And then this we would vortex, which means to shake it up on our vortex, and then let it incubate for 10 minutes to two hours to let that semen that's possibly in the stain uh, extract out into the liquid. And for purposes of the video, I have one here that I have let extract for a few hours. 10 minutes is plenty, but you can let it go for sake of convenience. And this, we now see that maybe the, the color has changed here in the liquid and extracted out into there. So what we would do is take the piece of cloth that's been extracting, and we have a little basket here with holes in the bottom. We would take this, take a toothpick, pull out that cloth that's been extracting, and put it into the basket, and then put the basket straight into the tube here and close it up. And now this we would put into a centrifuge, let it spin down for three minutes 
to pull all the liquid out of the cloth that was in there and to also pellet any sperm cells that might have extracted into the liquid to the very bottom of the tube. So then ideally what we would end up with is any enzymes from the seminal fluid in the liquid and then sperm cells that are intact pelleted at the very bottom. So now that we've centrifuged this down, we can open it up and discard this piece because theoretically there's nothing left on that piece of cloth. And now we're left with this liquid and then a sperm cell pellet in the bottom. So what we can do is a few things. We can take almost all the liquid here out of the tube, leave just a very small amount in the bottom to use for our sperm slide. And what I'll do is put half of this liquid into the P30 cartridge. And then I'll put half of the liquid into a clear test tube here. This is the third way you can test for the AP test, is by using this extract. Now I can add the AP reagent that we used before, a couple drops, into the test tube. And we can make sure again that this is turning now a nice bright pink or purple color. And this is really nice because you're not dealing with any fabric, so you're not having any colors that mess around with your reaction. You can see a nice dark purple there. That is a really good indication that you're dealing with semen. And that can just get thrown away. And then this P30 cartridge, much like the hematrace, will also run for 10 minutes to call it negative. But if you see the two lines, for it, uh, that will be a positive reaction, and you can just call it positive from that point, exactly like we showed you with the hematrace card. So you can see here, you can see a faint line there in the test um, area, and it'll only get darker, but right now that is positive. The third and final test that we will do for semen is actually a microscopic sperm cell search. And this is the only confirmatory test that we have for semen. If you see a sperm cell, that is 100% positive for semen being present on that item. However, we do deal with cases where we have males that maybe have gone through a vasectomy and do not have any sperm cells left. And so using the two other tests that I showed you, our two presumptive tests, together gives us an indication that semen is present without seeing sperm cells. So the body fluids that react with the acid phosphatase test um, that are not semen are not the same body fluids that react with the P30 test that are not semen. So we can pretty conclusively say that if we get a positive result on both those presumptive tests, that that's a good indication that we're dealing with semen. And maybe we have somebody who's been vasectomized or somebody with a really low sperm count and we're just not seeing sperm cells on the slide. So I'm going to show you how we make our sperm slides. And we're going to take the remaining portion here that was left in our tube that we extracted and hopefully have a sperm cell pellet in the bottom. So now we're ready to centrifuge this down. This is our centrifuge. Put our sample in one side, and then we always want to make sure that this is balanced. And so we will put a blank sample on the other side to balance it out as it's turning. Put on the lid. And then we'll let it go for three minutes. Now we should have our sperm pellet. To start making our sperm slide, we want to take the remainder of this liquid, pipette it up and down a few times to get that sperm cell pellet broken up. And then we'll go ahead and put it on a microscope slide that's on a hot plate set at 60 degrees Celsius. And it'll make a nice little dried stain. We let it heat up and heat fix to this microscope slide for 20 minutes. So after the stain is heat fixed to the slide, we're going to stain it with what's called Christmas tree stain. It's called Christmas tree because it's one red stain and one green stain. And the way the stain works is that the red stain will stain the sperm cell head. It'll stain half of it red and half of it pink. 
and then the green stain will stain the sperm tail and also will stain any skin cells that are there. The outer portion of the cell will be green and the nucleus of the cell will be red. So the first stain that I'm going to put on is the red stain. You just need enough stain to cover where you put your sperm cell pellet. And that sits for five minutes. After the five minutes is over, you wash it off with sterile water. And then you apply the green stain for only 15 seconds. And again, after the 15 seconds, you just wash it off. And now your microscope slide can sit here and dry, and when it's dry, it's ready to go onto our microscope to search for sperm cells. Here we are with our sperm slide, and this is one of our microscopes here in the lab. This is, has a dual function, it's a polarizing light microscope, and it also has a few filters here um, for a different fluorescent dye that we can also use to search for sperm. But for our sake today, with the Christmas tree stain, we don't need to use those filters, but it does have that function. So I'm going to put this slide right here on the table of the microscope. And then I need to look in the oculars here and get the uh, slide focus to where I can see what's on there and then start searching it to try to tell if I actually have sperm cells, which will be stained a red color. So I'm going to look in here, and I'm going to move the slide so I am focused where I know they're staining. Now I'm going to focus in on the slide and see if I see any sperm cells, which right away I do. There's a lot of sperm on this slide. So I'm going to get it right focused in the middle here. And then this microscope also has the capability of to being able to view in the oculars and on the computer at the same time. The oculars are always going to give you the best view, but if you're wanting to take a picture of what you're seeing, then it's really nice to have the computer view so that we can snap a picture and keep that in a case file, especially if we have a case where we're only seeing one sperm cell on the whole entire slide. That still gives us enough evidence to know that we have a semen stain because we are seeing that sperm cell. It's very sensitive. But when we only have one, it's hard to just say in your notes, I just have one sperm cell. So it's really nice to have a picture of that uh, cell. So I'm going to move the microscope to where it's half viewed on the screen and half viewed on the microscope. And so you can see here, this is the same view that I would be able to see out of the eyes of the microscope. And it's set to be an ideal color balance setting for um, the staining that we used. And all of these little red spots here are sperm cells. And so you can see that the top of the sperm cell is kind of a light pink, and then the rest of it is red. And then sometimes we will see a green tail on the sperm cell itself. We do not need a tail on the sperm to call it a sperm cell. All we need is that double stained head. And so what I'll do at this point is I can come in here and I can capture the image. So it'll capture it down here. And then I can save that image to be able to pull up later or put into our case file. And so this would be an example of a, an image that's been saved. We can attach it in our notes or we can print it out and put it with the report, whatever we need to do. And so this is a really good um, view of a lot of sperm. This would be what we would call a four plus sperm or the highest number of sperm that we would see on a slide. So it just means that there, there was a lot of semen there on that sample. There are some times when we might see nothing and then just one sperm cell and that's it. Or, I have another example here to show you. 
This is an example of what we might see when you have skin cells mixed with the sperm cells, which is something we would see on something like a swab from a rape kit that was taken from a, a female's body and then also has sperm cells on it. So this cell right here is what we call an epithelial cell, and that's a skin cell. And so here we've got the green staining pretty large there with a red nucleus. And that's just a normal skin cell, and the nucleus is much larger than a sperm would be. And then here, there, and there are three sperm on this slide as well. So we have a few epithelial cells and three sperm. And so we can say that not only do we have sperm there, but we also have some kind of skin cells. We don't know who they came from. They could come from the male or they could come from the female in this case. And then we would bring that on to DNA testing.